I think we can start. And just one comment about homework number one. I think you have done satisfactorily. There are a few things that you might be missing. Some of you might be missing. One of them is regarding the normal distribution. The answers to question number one, normal distribution and a general distribution, is available at Chopra or Silver and, and so on and so forth. So it's all available in those textbooks. I think in Chopra it is uh, in one of the appendices. You have exactly the figures that you are looking for. And in Silver, I think it's both in the appendix and in the text. I think chapter 12, if, if I'm not mistaken. So the, the reason that I gave question number one was the following. Uh, question number one simply wanted you to derive the basic quantities. And if you are going to make some computations especially, you might, you have to make sure that uh, you can represent terms, uh, each term in terms of the, the other one. So uh, one, I think only one, one person in the classroom noticed the following. And, and that's basically uh, the, the answer. In the simple news vendor problem, the expected number of units sold is actually expected number of expected demand. I, sh I don't need to write number. minus expected number of back orders. Now, this is always going to be true in terms of expectation. So it means that if you, we already know what the expected demand is. So if you compute one of them, you can represent the other in terms of uh, each other. So basically, this is a simplifying issue. And how, how about expected number of on hand or inventory at the end of the season is going to be simply Q star, the quantity that you order, minus expected number of units sold. Now, these are two identities which are sort of simple, but you can always use it for computations. Now, uh, when it comes to normal distribution, you always have the problem of a specific type of computation, which means that you have the demand going from minus infinity all the way to infinity. But uh, that's, that's a technicality. And remember, we said that if we are using normal distribution, we expect that the negative probability is 0. So you don't care whether you compute from minus infinity or 0. More or less, it's going to give you the same result. Okay. And in terms of normal functions, why normal functions are important? Because normal functions are computable. You have, every, uh, you have all the functions available in, even in Excel sheets. So computation is going to be very simple if you have a normal distributed demand. Of course, with the others, it's not going to be that difficult depending on the distribution. OK, so this was the purpose. Now, the purpose, there, is, there was one misunderstanding with respect to I gave you the question in terms of CU and CO, and then I asked you to write the expected profit. That was my mistake. I was, I mean, I meant expected cost, of course, but uh, I think it's not that, that important. Some of you have uh, redefined certain variables again, like price and so on which is acceptable, of course. There is no problem in that. And it was my mistake because I meant expected costs at optimality, of course. OK. Now, the second question is an interesting question because it looks like a simple news vendor problem. Uh, but it's not a simple news vendor problem. It has a lot of opportunities of development. So this is, this is probably the key. And uh, you can see that. Uh, the problem has two stages. Stage number two, well, I'm, let's say stage number one, which is later in the, in the date line. It's the later date. What happens is that you collect the back orders, and then you buy the back orders from a higher price. OK, so this is the second question. So what, what, what's happening here is as follows. 
Here, this is the season starts. You collect the demand. At this point, you make another decision. This decision is simply the following. You say that anything which is backordered during the season is going to be buy, uh, is going to be bought to a larger price V sub 2. Here, the unit price was V sub 1, and V sub 1 is less than V sub 2. What's the meaning of that? You expedite or you order, you give an emergency order. That was, I think, the wording in the text. Emergency order. So what happens is that they are going to bring it soon, and you satisfy the demand. Now, of course, here, this was an obvious decision. Why? Because we were given that V2 is still less than the price that we charge, okay, uh, so that we are still going to make some profit out of it. Okay? However, in general, this might not be the case. You might have different types of decision problem here. For example, we didn't have any decision problem with risk. We didn't have any fixed costs here. But in general, I would expect that if I'm giving an expedited order or a rush order, the number of units that I'm ordering might be very important. Like if you order one unit, it's going to be important. In short, what I mean is that even if you have a problem structure like this, here you have another decision possibility. This is a single period problem, but what you do is by dividing the timeline into two, you create another decision possibility, of course, with some costs. So what's happening here is that the classical news vendor problem is becoming more complicated, but it is getting closer to the reality. Now, there is one, this is, a, this is the typical format which is used for multi-stage decision-making purposes. But here, usually, this decision point, at this decision point, in your case, it wasn't a decision. It was very straightforward because you were going to buy the quantity which was missing. Whereas there might be more complicated cost structures there, which might prevent you of doing that kind of a computation. Now, we're going to see, I think, uh, if I'm not mistaken, we're going to see one or two models related to this issue. But this is, this is a rather interesting idea. So what, what this means is that you have two decision points. So it means that the decision that you are going to give here is going to be a function of the decision that you are going to give here. So the problem becomes a little bit more complicated. The initial decision is going to change given a certain cost structure or another one. But in this case, it didn't, of course, because it was very straightforward. So I think in order to reflect that, this was my intention of giving that problem. I think all of you did it uh, satisfactorily. So I don't think that we have any problem with respect to the news vendor case. OK. Any questions on this? Now, uh, I don't think that grades are, in that respect, very important, but it, it just reflects that you need to look certain things more. I think uh, the, the most common uh, issue which was missing is the application of normal distribution to the general structure, and you have to know a little bit more about normal distribution, probably, some of you at least. Okay. If you don't have any question, I'll describe Clark and Scarf paper. Now, uh, this week I will be talking about two different models. These are rather complicated models, but they are sort of the basic models of the so-called multi-echelon inventory systems. We know that supply chains in general are multi-level inventory systems, so these two work is going to be the fundamental work that most of the papers that we are going to see will be using in one way or another. Now, they don't directly use it. Sometimes they directly will, will use it. Now, this is probably the pioneering work in multi-echelon inventory systems, Clark and Scarf. What I will do is I'm not going to go over all the papers, but I will go over the first part of the paper, describe what's going on. I'm not going to reprove the theorem, but I will simply tell you what is found in the theorem. 
So I'll try to be as specific as possible. By the way, did you find any problems reading it? Or notation-wise, it, it might be a little bit different. It has some peculiarities, actually. It's not very similar to the type of problems that we see here, but I will probably, at the end, I, when I'm wrapping up the issue, I will tell the extensions of Clark and Scarf. Okay? Nowadays, we, we know more than what is written in this paper, luckily, okay, 50 years ago. But uh, basically, uh, this is going to be a, a very nice introduction. Now, the problem that we are going to deal will be simply as follows. Uh, one of the main issues in multi-echelon inventory systems is the management of the material. In other words, let's say that we made a decision of manufacturing a certain amount of items. Now, before you start the manufacturing, you need certain materials to be filled in the system. So in a typical inventory system, what you have is you have multiple levels. Level one is the manufacturing level. So let's say that you sell after the manufacturing level, or you can say that this is the retailer. So we are going, going to call this installation one. Installation meaning that we have a certain location there. So demand is going to be ob observed by this installation. Now, but before that, of course, we have other installation. Installation number two is going to be feeding installation number one. And similarly, we have N installations. And the end installation is the installation where the supplier of this end installation uh, installation has ample supply. So we assume that there is no limitation of the supplier which is feeding the end installation. But after that, you have some kind of a limitation going on. Why? Because every time that one is out of stock, we'll order two. So what will happen? If two has available, there is no problem. If it is not available, there will be additional delay, additional to the so-called lead time. So I'm going to assume that we have lead times L1, L2, and Ln are the lead times that we are going to use. We are going to assume that lead times are constants, but this, these lead times do not take into the these lead times occur if you have sufficient material here. In other words, let's say that you order one unit and that unit is not available. So the lead time is only going to be L1 after the material is available in installation 2. So there is a delay because of material unavailability. So lead time is like transit time. You, you put everything in a, in a wagon and send it. So it is sort of constant. Okay. So this is more or less the multi-echelon structure. And again, in this structure, the key is that the demand only occurs at this endpoint, which is not very important at this point because we are going to uh, talk more about this system. Now, so I will give more information later on on this system, there will be some specific structure. But what I want to do is I want to analyze, as we did in most of the other systems, this single installation problem first, give some notation, and then move that notation to the multi-echelon structure. By the way, multi-echelon means that we have multiple levels. So echelon uh, is sort of a jargon uh, which stands for level. So you have multiple levels. For example, the typical MRP system is a multi-echelon system. You can imagine that. You have raw materials, then components. So this is similar to that, but here we are not necessarily talking about assembly or anything similar to that. Okay? So, for example, this might be one manufacturer. You sent semi-finished item to the next one, and then you finish the item, this might be wholesaler, this might be distributor, so on and so forth. 
Okay, so you have the movement of material. Okay, any questions on this simple description? Okay, now let's look at the single installation case. So we have installation one, and what I have here is I have the demand. I'm going to assume that demand is stationary, which means that it doesn't change with time. And I am going to use the notation given in the text. So phi of t gives the demand, is, is the demand distribution. And this demand distribution doesn't change with time. We are going to have a periodic review system, which means that we are going to review the periods, uh, review the system every period. So that's the definition of period. So those Little l, sub 1, sub 2, and so on, are integer multiples of those periods. Okay? Now, extension is possible if these are not integer multiples. It's not that difficult to make the extension. Okay. So, uh, this is basically the idea. So, if we have one installation, it means that the supplier here is going to have infinite capacity when you have a single installation. Now, what is the difference between this problem and the news vendor problem? News vendor problem is a single period problem, whereas here we have multiple periods, so it means that we can carry inventory from one period to the next. Okay? So that, that's the main difference. In, in the uh, news vendor problem, that you only lived for a single season, you, you bought the item, you sold it in the market, remaining one, oops, you uh, have the salvage related to that. Oh. Okay. Now, let's bring in some notation. Well, let me, let me use the, this board still to write the notation. I am going to assume that I am going to have x1 defined as the beginning inventory. This beginning inventory is the inventory which is available in the beginning of the semester, uh, in the beginning of the period. Okay, semester and periods are almost synonymous. And in the beginning of the period, uh, and this is going to include the shipments that have arrived in the beginning of that period. Okay? So this is X1. And let Wj be defined as the number of units to be delivered in J periods. So W sub 1 is going to be the number of units which are on the way coming and will be delivered next period, okay, in one period. W sub 2 is going to be the amount which is on the way and will be delivered in two periods. This paper also defines this Wj for j, j is equal to 0. Okay, W0 is already included in X1. Okay, W0 is, means that it's the quantity that arrived this period and it is included in the definition of X1. That's a little bit, that's a little bit confusing, you're right. Good point, yeah. Okay, so we are going to have j's from 1, <coughs> because of this notation, to L1 minus 1. I am going to assume that the lead time is L sub 1. So this is the only notational difference that I'm going to have from the paper. I prefer to use L's rather than lambdas. Lambdas might bring more confusion. So L is L sub 1 is going to be the lead time that I'm going to use. So W sub 0 has already arrived. Okay? Now, what are the costs? Now, in this system, we will deal with different types of costs. And let me start, well, let me write it over here. One will be the purchasing cost. We can use different types of structures, but we are going to be confined with two types of structures. So C of Z 
is going to denote the function where we charge uh, uh, z is the quantity that you buy. So one possibility will be the economies of scale structure. So the cost that we pay will be k plus c sub z, c times z. If z is positive, otherwise it will be zero. So you have a fixed cost. Or c of z is going to be a linear function of uh, z. So either we're going to have this kind of a structure or this kind of a structure. So this is the case where k is equal to 0. Now we are already familiar with these two. For example, this structure was the structure that we had in the news vendor problem, whereas the previous one is the structure that we have in the EOQ and uh, other continuous review stochastic uh, demand problems. Now, we are going to have linear holding cost and linear back order cost, but this is not necessarily what we should have. We, we are going to talk about the condition later on. So we're going to have linear holding cost. Now, the only difference that we have from in this model is that we are going to charge the linear holding cost to the stock at the beginning of the period. So this is basically the difference. In other words, the quantity that we are going to charge holding cost for is going to be the quantity that we begin the period. Now, if you recall from your other courses, that kind of a notation or structure has been changed, transformed to charging at the end of the period. Okay? So, for example, in the news vendor problem, you charge the quantity which is left over at the end of the period, which is meaningful, actually, because basically you want to get rid of it. But if you are continuously holding inventory, then this is one structure that you can use, although in later years, most of the researchers preferred to charge at the end of the period, but there is no, no significant difference in the results, of course. Now, why, what is the logic of carrying in the beginning of the period? The logic is that in the beginning of the period, you have very high inventory levels. So you might be carrying that throughout the period because demand might be concentrated at the end of the period. So you actually carry a lot of inventory and if you only charge at the end of the period, that might be misleading. So this is, this is more or less the idea. Remember, in, in Turkey, what they would do is, towards the end of the period, end of the month, okay, they will make some effort so that they will sell and the inventory levels would be lower. So this is basically, this type of an accounting is going to overcharge the inventory cost, as if you have been carrying that throughout the period. Whereas the current one that we use, charge at the end of the period, is going to undercharge the inventory carrying cost. So, I mean, there is no correct one, but this is basically an understanding, and this is how it is used in this paper. Any problems with this? Okay. And so we're going to have linear backorder cost. And this is going to be charged at the end of the period. Again, this is a little bit pessimistic view because basically this means that even if you are going to satisfy that customer within the period sometime, you charge yourself a cost which is identical as if you only we're able to satisfy the customer at the end of the period. So this is a little bit over penalizing maybe, but you wouldn't, we, we don't know whether that is meaningful or not. But these are again, as I said, these, these are details that you can easily change and uh, modify and do in the way that you want. Okay, so uh, given all these two and assuming that we are going to backlog all the excess demand. In other words, we are not going to lose any customers. So if we cannot satisfy the demand, we're going to satisfy it next period. 
Now, given this, we write this so-called LX1 function, which is the single period cost function. Now, this is the single period cost function. In other words, given that I start the period with X units, what is the cost that I'm going to pay for holding and shortage? Okay. Now, this is interesting because probably you haven't seen this before, but I think this is the correct way of representing the inventory carrying cost, okay, and inventory carrying cost and back order cost. We are going to have two options depending on X being positive or X being zero. Now, uh, if X is positive, which means that we have a physical inventory that we start with, Okay, so we are going to charge holding costs to that quantity. Okay, and then we are going to see the demand during that period. And if we are short with respect to satisfying the demand, we are going to incur back order costs at the end of the period. So this means that if we start with X units, if the demand is larger than X, we are going to have back orders. Then this means that if I write demand as t, t minus x phi of t dt is going to give me the expected number of back orders, and I am going to charge this with so-called p. Now this is true if x is positive, if I have a physical inventory to start with. Now, what is the cost that you pay if you don't have, if X is already negative? What is the, uh, what is the cost that you are going to give if the inventory level is already negative? So what does this mean? This means that you are going to back order all the demand. So this means that T minus X, oops, I'm sorry. So you are going to take the integral from zero to infinity. T minus X, F of X, oops, phi of T, DT is going to be what you are paying. Note that this already takes into account the negative value that you have. X is negative, which means that if X is negative, that quantity is always going to be carried to the end, and then you have the additional ones coming in. Actually, I think it, might, it could have been better to write this as uh, minus X. Okay, I, by the way, I have to multiply this with P, and this is if X is negative. So minus X, if X is negative, minus X is going to be the quantity that you are going to carry from this period to the next as back orders. And then you have the expected demand, which is the new back orders that, are, that has arrived. Now, it turns out that uh, this is the typical mistake that we make when we are doing some computation on inventory systems. Now, we have the following understanding. As back orders are not desirable, we always think that the x value that we are going to start the beginning of the period will always be positive. This is what we think. Okay? So if, if it is always positive, then we only see the about term, of course. But in reality, when you have lead times, and if you are dealing with a complicated system where demand values can be arbitrary, there might be situations where this is going to occur, because we, we're talking about random demand. Okay? You might have very high demand. It might be misleading in one way or another. Now, and moreover, you can have stochastic lead times. Lead times might not be constants. So in reality, when you are charging costs, if you don't take this into account, you are making a mistake. Okay? And usually this mistake is done even if you are very simply simulating an inventory system. Because there is always a probability that the starting inventory might be negative. So this is the correct way of taking that into account. Most of the service measures which are defined 
in silver, Pike Peterson, other textbooks does not take this possibility into account. They always assume that you are more or less going to satisfy the demand and in the latest you're going to satisfy the demand in one period. That's the idea. So you, you will, in one way or another, you will always start with a positive inventory, which might be true in reality because you give emergency orders in these type of situations. Okay. Any questions on this? Am I going fast or slow? I think uh, I want to go slow because I want you to follow uh, this in, in detail. Okay. Now, we are going to assume that we have finite periods. And we are going to use alpha as the discounting rate. Now, there are two types of problems that we would like to solve. One of them is the so-called average cost criterion problem, where we have infinite horizon problem. And like the EOQ problem, it's an infinite horizon problem. Okay? And what you do is you try to minimize the average cost which incurs during a specific time period. The alternative is to solve a finite period problem. But in order to differentiate the value that you generate this period versus a period back uh, in, in the future, you do some kind of a computation to, uh, to represent the present worth of the value. So what you need to do is you need to discount the future costs so that the effect of the cost which is going to happen way in the future is less compared to the cost that you incur today. Okay? It's like time value of money kind of business. Okay? So you give less value to the future because immediate uh, implementation is much more important. So if alpha is equal to 1, of course, it becomes a regular finite horizon problem where you don't differentiate periods. If, and usually we expect alpha to be less than 1. OK. Now, uh, what we are going to do is now we are going to build up this structure, the uh, the relation. So this is the cost that you incur in a single period. But the thing is, when you give, when you start with x, you are going to end up with x minus t in the inventory. And in the meantime, you are going to make some decisions to give some orders, so on and so forth. So basically, this is what we are trying to find. Now, let me define c sub n of x1 W1, W2, WL1 minus 1. Now, what are these? This is the current inventory level. Net inventory might be negative or positive. W1 is the amount which is going to arrive next period. W2 is the amount which is going to arrive the period after that. And WL sub 1 minus 1 is going to be the amount which is going to arrive in, uh, at this point in time. Now, what I will do is, of course, I am now going to make a decision with respect to what to order. So I will actually make a decision, let's say, why, and order a certain quantity, which is going to affect my inventory system only after L my L sub 1 periods. Because basically, if I order, it's only going to come at that point in time. So these are the effects of my previous decisions, of course. These are my previous decisions. Now, let me define the Cn as the minimum expected discounted total cost for the n period problem. So given that you have x1, this Cn simply considers the set of optimal decisions that you are going to give for n periods, okay? and it gives the minimum 
cost function value. Okay? So it is the optimal solution. So this is the way that I'm going to define. So what am I going to do now? If this is Cn, so now I'm going to write the relation. So this is going to be equal, so I will do some kind of a minimization. And this minimization will be over z values, where z is the quantity that I'm going to order this period. Okay? Given that I have x1 available, and I have all this configuration, I will solve a minimization problem. Okay? And what am I going to minimize? Now, first of all, I am going to pay some kind of a purchasing cost. Okay? I don't know the structure yet. It doesn't matter at this point. Then, I am going to pay one period cost L, X, L of X sub 1. Okay? And then, what will happen? Then, I will be carried out to the next period. So, I, w I have to use discounting now. Now, what will be my state in the beginning of the next period? My state in the beginning of the next period is going to be, my current state is x1. I know that w1 will be arriving, so x1 plus w1, but I have to subtract the demand that incurred this period. So, what I have now is I have Cn minus 1, which is the optimal solution from n minus, for the n minus 1 period problem. And the argument of this C is simply going to be x1 plus w1 minus t. And of course, excuse me, so this is my first argument. My second argument will be w2. Okay, so all the quantities which are on order is going to shift with one period. So instead of W1, now I'm going to have W2. Okay, so this W2 quantity will be arriving at the next period. Okay, because I already moved for one period. Then I will have W3. And then what will be the last term? Z, which I currently ordered. Okay, this is my decision. So this z is going to be the last element, the, the last argument of c sub n minus 1. Why? Because what I am representing here is, are the quantities on order. So the quantities on order were w1 through w l sub 1 minus 1. Now I moved one period. So w1 has arrived. So w2 is going to go here. Okay, W3 is going to go here. This is going to go here. The last argument is going to be the quantity that I ordered at the end period. Okay? I'm simply following uh, the, 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 the ordering structure. So this is going to be my new argument. And what I want to have is this is going to be the cost. And depending on this state... I am going to incur some costs for the next n minus 1 period. So I am assuming that I am going to get the optimal decision. So it means that I will get the expectation of this. So this is phi of t dt, and t is going to change from 0 to infinity. So for all possibilities, let's say that demand incurred by one unit, I am going to have uh, the optimal costs. That there will be another decision that I'm going to give, which is not obvious here. It is hidden, uh, but let me close the parenthesis. In other words, this is the problem that you solve for n minus 1 period, periods that you have in front of you. And we are assuming that you can solve that problem optimally. Now, the nice thing about this structure, well, any questions first of all? Now, yes. Okay, uh, n is, we are solving an n period problem. Whereas L, min L sub 1 is the lead time. So it, uh, they have nothing to do with each other. In other words, one of them is a fixed number which describes the number of periods you need your supplier to feed you. 
Okay? The other one is the number of decision points that you have in the future. So I am sort of simply saying that I am solving an period problem. N might be 200. So basically now I have 200 periods and I'm assuming that given this starting state, I know how to make a good decision. I optimally, and this is my optimal value, the optimal value is actually a minimization problem over which you make a decision at this point on the quantity that you are going to order, n periods to go, and this is going to be, you are, you are going to have your current costs, plus you have the costs which is going to come after the next period. But the thing is, next period you are also going to make a decision. Remember the second problem of the homework? Okay, so in that case the decision was simple, but this is now more complicated. You make another decision. That decision is going to be a function of the state, of course. So what I am doing is, this is the optimal expected cost value if this is the state. And I am going to take the average over all possible states. This is what I am doing here, actually. Okay, taking the expected value over all demands that incur which is going to change this part of the equation. Okay? Now, uh, my decision Z is going to take all of these into account. Of course, this is sort of the so-called dynamic programming structure. Okay? So what you have is, you have actually, you are going to write this for all the periods. And eventually, you are going to have the last period. You're going to write for that and then build up and write for all of those. Now, this is a problem which is solved, and what I will do is I will only summarize the results of this, of this problem. Okay? But we, we, this is basically dynamic programming. And in, in homework, actually, what you have done is very similar to this. This part was, you, you solved a two-period problem, but this part was very simple, structured. Okay, so you wrote this and optimized and, and you were fine. Okay, but you actually, what we should do when it is a little bit more complicated is something like this. Okay, now uh, any questions on this? So here actually Z is the minimizing point. So this is the minimizing quantity to order. Note that I am not going, we are not allowing z to be negative, which means that you cannot dispose any items. Because, okay, okay. because what, what, what you have is, this is, this is important because this is basically telling us about some avenues of improvement. This is 1960, so those avenues are, some of them are already considered. But you see that here, if you start with excess inventory, for one reason or another, if you think that you have a lot of inventory, okay, you cannot get rid of that inventory because you're not allowed to have Z, which is non-negative. You're not allowed to have Z, which is negative. So you have to live with that, with that inventory. Whereas if you are living sort of... Uh, in a reasonable world, then there should be a cost associated with getting rid of the inventory as well. Okay? So that, that kind of a problem is, is solved, but then the nice structures that we have here is, not, is no longer available. Because you usually are going to have a different cost for disposing inventory. Okay? For buying inventory, we have C of Z. For disposing, we should have something else, actually. Okay, but this is something that we need to keep in mind because one of the problems in supply chains is as follows. Now, here we assumed stationary demand. In general, demand is not stationary, of course. What you do is you forecast the demand, and depending on your forecasts, you build up some expectation or you try to get smaller, okay, depending on the forecast. So what you do is... The, the distributions that you see for the future are not necessarily going to be the same. You might have some expectations, but may not be the same. So in the case where demand is continuously going down, 
then disposing is, should be a very economic factor that must be considered. Think about a spare part inventory system for, let's say, automobiles. Okay? So this is the typical one. So let's say that you are keeping spare parts for Tofash Serce, which is no longer in manufacturing. It's been almost 10 years. And there is also a new law which tells you that you cannot operate automobiles that are older than a certain age. So what's, what's going to happen then? Well, the parts, the spare part demand for search is going to go down. And I can see the end of life for search's spare parts. So demand is going down. You are using this model to plan your spare part inventory system. Okay, then if you are not allowed to dispose, then uh, it, might be, it might create a lot of problems, of course. You might have excess inventory that you see and you really want to dispose. Now, some people say that, well, disposing is very simple, just get rid of it. Okay? Well, sometimes you might need to pay some money to get rid of uh, inventory. Okay? It's not that easy. You cannot throw it in the waste. Always, of course. You forget about getting some money back. Okay? You might need to pay something in order to dispose the item. So that decision is not very straightforward. But here, we don't have that. Okay. Now, I will talk about some properties of the optimal solution now, uh, which are, you might be familiar with these properties, but I think this is sort of the solution for the single installation uh, periodic review problem. Now, you're going to see that, well, you might be familiar with that, but there will be a number of characteristics of the solution. So, properties of the optimal solution. So, we start with this functional equation. We call it functional equation. And sometimes, I mean, there are different names given to that. But this is basically, uh, these are the properties. Number one, optimal policy... is only a function of the total stock on hand plus on order. Now, this is the way that it is, it is written, but I would prefer to say net stock because on hand stock is usually the physical stock, but in, in our case it might be negative. Okay? So we should write, we should correct it as the net stock. Total net stock will be probably much better. I did, I already, uh, I mean, this is the way that it is given in the text, but I think. In 50 years, probably, the, the names that we give to different inventory situations are now set. So, when we talk about on hand, we talk about physical inventory. But in, our, in this case, we're talking about net inventory, which might be negative, the X value. Okay? So, I think it's better to call it X. Okay. And optimal policy is only a function of the total net stock plus on order quantity which we call inventory position. Inventory position includes the current net inventory plus the inventory which is on the way. Now, this is, of course, regardless of the dates of delivery. So what does this mean? This means that I have this complicated notation here. Actually, I don't need that complicated notation. I only need the sum of these because the decision is only a function of the sum of these. Now, let's think about why this is true. Log uh, let's try to build up intuition on this. So it simply says that if you have 
This is the timeline. So this is the current period. So you have period N all the way to period 1. Okay, this is N period to go, N minus 1 period to go. So what's happening here is that when you are making the decision, you have some scheduled arrivals here from your previous orders. It turns out that the decision that you give is, which is going to arrive here, this is the lead time, so you are only going to decide for the quantity which is going to come at this point in time. So it turns out that the costs which incur before that is not in your control anymore. Because you already had made up your mind, you gave some orders, and you no longer can control anything that's happening here. So your only concern then would be not the dates which they arrive, but eventually you are only interested in the inventory position or inventory level that you will be left with when that uncontrollable period ends. So whether this arrives before or after is not going to affect you, the total quantity that arrives is going to affect you. So this is, this is the logic, very simple. And you can prove it actually using those functional equations that we wrote there. So this is one result. And as a result of this property, we would be able to write Cn in a much simpler way, and that will be what I will do after the break. Questions? Okay, I'll see you after the break.